don't know who the owner is. I stole it during Canada today. The dog is dead now, so let's, re let's respect it. So, you want to start? You can start. So, Wait, what are you going now? We have to introduce ourselves. Introduce ourselves. Yes. Nobody knows what we're going to do. So, we're not researchers. Uh, we're product builders, right? I mean, you know Greg from Chainsafe? Uh, woo! I'm here for Phylax. And it's very important to set the stage. We want to approach this from a product build, builder perspective. We want to help you, under, you know, make a decision when you want to build a product and you're choosing what technology to use, uh, which technology is best, from a very high level point of view. Yeah, so our goal here is to present you with two topics, T, T's and ZK. Um, and we're not here to like give some new paradigm in how these are done, how you build with them, but rather think about how you actually can like ship quicker with while thinking about like the trade-offs and the different like advantages that either of them have. Um, and, and, and you know, unfortunately, our other counterpart, Georgios, couldn't make it here, but we thought we'd bring a very nice inspirational quote from him. You know, this is a very important year. People should not forget that the number one priority is shipping, shipping and shipping. Bringing that SF energy here. Um. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, so we'll just quick, can somebody from the, the audience here just give us like the, like a very simple explanation of like, one liner on like describing how you think about ZK. Oh, tough crowd. Yes. Zero knowledge is cryptographic protocols in which you can prove elements and attributes about a certain data set or the uh, operation of a certain protocol and have both public and private arguments. Like, can, I, can I try again? <laughs> <laughs> it's a cryptographic protocol slash system that allows you to create, oh, thank you, wow. So important, I get a microphone. Um, so zero knowledge is a cryptographic protocol or system or method in which you can formally describe arguments as input into a protocol or system that let you prove certain ele elements or attributes about something you're defining. I'm so happy. Cryptographic we had you. way. So happy he had you. you. did it so much better than we were going to. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you do this <laughs> Yeah, give me the mic. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to add to that? Um, yeah, basically it's, you want to either prove that you know something without telling the counterparty what you know, or you want to prove that you made a very uh, complex computation without requiring the other party to repeat uh, that complex computation. Verifiable computation essentially and private computation. Yeah, the two main components. Um, next up, does anybody, is anyone here actually familiar with T's? Aside, ah, let's, we'll take it, we'll take a new, yeah. We, we, new entrant. Would you like to give a shot at it? Sorry, either or, who? Oh, you talked, so yeah, it's your, it's your, your, your game. Thank you. So trusted execution environments is a chip where um, nothing's meant to leak out. Um, you put the inputs in, the outputs out, the outputs come out, and the, uh, the calculation is not meant to leak out. And that is done by the chip keeping a secret key, um, signing the uh, code with that key so that you know what the code is running, um, signing the outputs probably with the same key, and the key is basically Intel's key in Intel definitely won't tell anybody about it. Oh, it's a sub-key of Intel's key. I'm so happy you have that opinion. Can't wait to get going on this talk. Um, yeah, so to put it like really, that was very good, bang on, and to put it like really simply, layman's terms, 
you know, we have a specialized chip that's private, uh, that's secured in a way that you feed it inputs similar in the sim construct of the same mental model of ZK where you give it an input and you get this like verified output. You give it into this chip, the chip then returns you out that output. You can sort of think of a similar mental model to how like trusted enclaves work in like a phone. You know, the rest, nothing else has access to like what's inside. It's like a black box. Allegedly. 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 <laughs> The tomatoes are in the back. If you want to use them, you can get them. Fundamentally, though, let's talk about the key difference. It really comes down to when we look at the two different pieces of technology, um, the main difference really comes down to a hardware versus like a math. So like the, the, the main difference is hardware versus math. One is like a strict, like a strict hardware solution, and the other is a strict uh, software solution, T's being the hardware, ZK being a software solution. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting to, to observe here that um, T's are actually a bit better with privacy in the sense that in an untrusted hardware, uh, you could have private computation, while in untrusted hardware, you can't have uh, ZK for privacy, right? So you want to do ZK. You, you have to do it on your lo local trust machine. Well, with verifiable computation, uh, it's actually, uh, the ZK is better, because uh, if, you pr if you generate uh, a valid proof, then it's impossible that the computation was not uh, valid as well. All right, so there, again, we're not coming at this from the research angle, so we're going to pre present this from the perspective of like you are making a decision on how you're developing your product. And from our perspective, that comes from five key verticals where you need to actually make a decision on like what's going to be the difference between picking ZK over T's. Uh, the five that we want to focus on today, um, they're, they're, listen, the, the list could go on and on, but I think like these are like some of the most important ones, especially when you look at like building out like your product spec, you're, you're debating with research, your research team or whoever, you know, you want to look at performance, you want to look at security, the trust assumptions, Mo one of the most important ones being, it's important too, being ease of integration and maturity. And I think this is really important when you get into the tooling side of things and we start to talk about like, what is the actual trade-offs you're making when you want to go and implement this? Because at the end of the day, you know, depending on where the tooling sits for both, this is going to like dramatically change how you think about, you know, what's the best outcome for your team, right? Like ultimately we want to build chip fast and you have to think about, am I going to go spend 10 year or 10 months, you know, trying to fit a, I said tomatoes, come on, not glasses. If you're going to throw something, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> Ultimately, it's, it's going to come down to, is it like, are you going to spend 10 months trying to build a solution around something because it does not give you exactly what you need, or are you going to just quickly get that integration done and get the product out because you were able to scope it well enough that it met the criteria on the performance, security, and trust assumption side? And that's what we'll get into in a little bit. I think uh, a uh, very interesting wor word here is, uh sufficiently and appropriate. Uh, you want to choose the trade-offs that you really care about, and you want to make sure that you're making the trade-offs uh, that are really important for your application. Uh, maybe for one application, it makes sense to maximize on trust assumptions. You want to have the least amount of trust assumptions. But maybe for another application, that's not that important. It's more important to actually go to market quick. So you want to optimize for recent integration. And we feel that you know, as a community, sometimes we over-index on trust assumptions and security. Cool. So let's dive in quickly into the stacks. Now, we're not going to cover overly deeply on the ZK set. I think from when it comes especially to, you know, the blockchain space, all we hear about is ZK. 
And I think getting a little bit deeper into the T side will be uh, more interesting and relevant for today. Uh, obviously, we've got kind of like two generalized categories of how you interact with ZK. Uh, you can go and write the circuits yourself. Um, this is in circuit pro like circuit programming. These are the language like the more popular, hardened and mature libraries that you commonly see are Circom, Halo 2, and Plonky 2. Obviously, Plonky 3 is out right now, um, but I think we're still kind of waiting for a little bit of a maturity on that. And then we have ZK VMs, not to be confused with ZK EVMs. Um, I made that mistake earlier. Like a ZK VM, what it does is it takes, it's the kind of the same concept of the EVM. It's we're scoping down the privilege of like what you can execute into like a nice little playground. So they've, ZK VMs take a bunch of circuits that have been pre-written uh, using one of the many libraries and put that into a nice packaged playground environment for you to then go and execute whatever you want to do or build whatever you want to build on top of. Um, three, the three kind of big ones today, SP1, which was recently launched by Succinct, uh, Risk Zero by Risk Zero, which has been around for it's been a little bit more, much much more mature. It's been around for much longer, and another new one, Jolt, which is by the A16Z team, and that one is also quite new. Um, and it's important to note that the reason we are not talking about EVM or ZK EVMs mm -hmm. is because the EVM is, by definition, very constrained. So, for a product builder, does it really make sense to? You know, to be forced to write solidity and like use the EVM as a computational model, and not use the you know one of these ZK VMs where basically uh, you're uh, compiling Rust code into machine code for the Risk Five uh, architecture, which is then proved on top of uh, circuits, right? Which enables you to write quite arbitrary Rust programs, so you can actually have uh, uh, products and you can actually create uh, things quite easily. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point, is that I think in this space specifically, we really dig into the notion that when we build a product or we use ZK, for example, it's like in the context of the EVM, when in reality there are many pieces outside and surrounding that we can use. Um, that the blockchain becomes complementary to your product, and like that's not like the core focus of why you're using it. And so, being able to be more expressive by using a zk VM really allows you to like do a little bit more. And then, if you want to, go and prove it against a zk EVM if that's how you want to go about it, and use the EVM for whatever you need. Like, be expressive and creative, then constrain yourself down. Um, and on the other side, we have the T stack. Um, T started mainly in more, uh, not in cloud computing really, but more mainframe context. Uh, they have been around for a while, mainly for, uh, mainly used in the medical industry where you want to do some computation about sensitive user data, uh, but you don't want to leak, obviously, uh, that information. And only recently, they entered the, uh, the industry that we call cloud computing. Uh, first was with HDX uh, by Intel. And essentially, uh, a small part of the CPU uh, is what we call the secure element. And the idea is that the user can load programs inside, uh, and then they can run. Uh, you can prove their, that they run correctly using attestations. Uh, that element has some private key, so you can send encrypted data using the public key of the secure element. Because the CPU really, while the security boundary is on the die, like literally, uh, because the CPU, because it's user code and it's in user space, it proved that there's quite a few attacks that you can do from uh, software attacks. So a few years after, uh, AMD launched uh, Another approach where basically they say, okay, what if we have a CPU and we have a, th a thin hypervisor on top of it, and then we encrypt the memory of a whole VM. So there is a VM that runs on top of the hypervisor, but its memory is essentially encrypted uh, based on the root of trust being uh, a particular ARM component uh, on the die. 
And because you have this uh, hypervisor and uh, VM isolation, it's actually quite a bit more hard to uh, perform software attacks. Obviously, that assumed a trust assumption here that the hypervisor is trusted. So AMD actually upgraded their technology and they started experimenting with uh, encrypting even the, uh, the CPU registers. So when the VM uses the CPU, um, it actually encrypts the data that is stored on the register to perform the computations. And then they even added uh, integrity checks. So basically, they make it harder for a malicious hypervisor to, uh, to leak information. Obviously, offline attacks are still possible, right? You can literally connect uh, cables to the CPU and try to exfiltrate data. Uh, so there is a limit on what uh, the software stack can do there. And then after the, uh, this new paradigm by AMD, uh, Intel actually launched TDX, which is basically the same thing. Uh, in a more, <laughs> in a more uh, they, they do a little, a little bit of more things around security, uh, but the core idea is the same, and it doesn't matter of the, uh, of the details. So in a way, we could say that TDX is actually even more uh, secure than AMD um, against, against uh, untrusted hypervisor, right? And when we say hypervisor, it's essentially the cloud provider. So here, essentially, we have two layers of trust. The first layer of trust is the chip manufacturer, and the next layer is the hypervisor or the cloud computing software uh, platform that you use to perform the computation. So back to your point. Can we really trust the third parties? Right, as Odysseus brought up, one of the, there's two big main flaws with T's. One, software, is that key, is there something an issue with the software? Could that key be leaked? The second one, being side channel attacks, arguably a little bit more challenging. You know, this means data center is compromised and people are actually putting wires physically inside servers and directly on chips. Um, those are pretty scary and obviously big concerns. And it would imply that really we've got like very rogue parties in relatively well-established businesses here. But the more you think about it and the more we've thought about it, I think you can. And I think you can trust these third parties, AMD, Intel, for the chipsets, and your cloud providers like AWS for your cloud hosting where you're getting access to those chipsets. There's a few angles I can, we can nail, we can like try and hit this home. And I think Odysseus said really well earlier, which is, mm, I won't say word for word, but, <laughs> It would imply getting your head out of somewhere. But how important are you? Let's be, let's be like really frank. Like when we're talking about what they provide, the ingress and outgress in a day to day, in a daily basis, and the value on like 99% of the other servers in that room, how important are you to these massive Chipset, chip makers, and data centers. What are you building and what are you what is your product that you're building that is like so valuable that there is risk of completely tarnishing and having PR issues, massive lawsuits against these big entities for the sake of your small program running on a chipset somewhere? And I have to give like that honest question to yourself because really like I don't think any of us are that important for them to do that. Um, you are. Ah, listen, <laughs> I'll tell you after. Because um, like let's let, let, let's let's look like historically what has happened. What has happened in a data center before? It was like five six years ago. We had a schematic not line up to the motherboard that was found in some data centers. Overnight, 
uh, overnight, over the course of a few months, because it's a lengthy process, every data center in the in United States ripped out that motherboard from their data centers. And the entire supply chain, because it was a supply chain attack, was completely rendered obsolete and removed from their supply chain, I guess, like distribution channels. They take security relatively seriously. And again, it comes down to like how important are you? So if we can like remove this you know, assumption that you're not overly important, how much trust can you now apply and put into the chipsets and the data centers where they're hosting and providing you this service? And then think how much value is currently locked the systems uh, that we use. And think about the organizations, like, you know, the biggest organization in crypto. Are they that secure? Like, you know, <laughs> the rounding hack was a 60, $600 million from private keys that got leaked. And it was proven that it was actually uh, North Korea agents. And it's uh, calculated that $2 billion is about the nu their nuclear program. So about half of it was uh, financed by Ronin. So, <laughs> you know, maybe we're kind of having double standards here, where we have much more immature organizations, smaller organizations in crypto that, uh, you know, safeguard essentially huge amounts of money. And then it's us that says to Intel and AMD that we don't trust them. How do you feel about that? Yeah? Uh, thank you. Um, so for my analysis, because I've, I've done a lot of thinking about uh, especially the third party assumption for T's. And the one caveat I see with it is not dissimilar to sophisticated nation state actors. Like if your threat model is against a nation state, I mean like you're pretty hard pressed in any circumstance, math versus hardware to like find a defense that's pretty capable of withstanding that type of thing. But generally speaking, like considering the relationship between you know these chip manufacturers, AMD and Intel, which are Western state actors, so they're more likely to cooperate with Western intelligence if you assume that they get compromised. But my understanding is that on the T's, it's a certificate and an encryption key on the hardware device produced by Intel. Yeah. The only way that I can kind of see a clandestine operation occurring in which the the T is compromised is if the, for example, the NSA were to cooperate with Intel in producing keys that can, yeah. in some backdoor mechanism, be flipped on to be encrypted and attested to on those devices. And I mean, like you saw the controversy with the management engine. I'm sure you are familiar with the controversy with the management engine. It's like, well, how do you, even in the case setting of how do you enable the back door, right? What's the chance that a third, that a security a, a researcher isn't going to be able to find that back door and the evidence that it was even found, right? Like that's a pretty complicated thing. Imagine somebody re discovering an alternative key on the device and it's like, hey, Intel, what is this undocumented key on the T, right? That would be quite controversial. So I, I, I tend to agree that you can kind of trust these parties in the sense of that. And, and I mean, it doesn't hurt to ever have the addition of defense in depth. I mean, in Entropy's case, if we do use T's for our network, our, like the addition of this is threshold signing, and so threshold cryptography is on top of this, and so it requires not only the collusion of one of these nodes, it requires the collusion of multiple nodes. So that's another thing that you can take into account when you're building your products is like, is there a component of multi-party computation or is this something that we can distribute where other parties are able to, to cooperate in the computation of something to guarantee security? I think that's a big part of it. Um, but also it's really just recognizing that like, generally speaking, like if your threat actor is a nation state, Again, you're going to have a really hard time trying to come up with a threat model that is resistant to them. Um, but the best you can really do is just say splitting trust across as many parties as you can and using the T as just a first layer of security. Yeah, that's all I have to say um, about it. One of my favorite blog posts um, 
it says about uh, how to choose a strong password. It says there are basically you have two threat actors. Uh, you have a certain intelligence agency uh, that is infamous, and then you have everything, everyone else. If it's everyone else, just use a strong password. If that's if, if it's that organization, you're kind of dead already. So it doesn't really matter. And what I mean by that is that you know, if the NSA is really wants to target entropy, there's you know so many layers they can do it that. Uh, you know. It would probably be third governance. Like if, as yeah, you exactly. with crypto in general, it usually comes from the top down. Like it just yeah. requires you, hey, you need to write some code that does X, Y, or Z for us, and if you don't, yeah. we're gonna fuck you up in the in the courts, you know, FISA yeah. or some shit, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think for most applications, you know, I think we're cool. <laughs> You're not that important. To me, you are. To them, you're not. So for performance, um, it's actually very easy and a very tough topic. It's tough because everyone releases their benchmarks in the, the way they seem it's best. So it's actually quite hard to understand the uh, what's up. You know, so you want to compare uh, risk zero and SP1 performance uh, depending on who you know invested in your company? You have different opinions, uh, so you have to. There's like a very, it's a very new topic, right? So SP1 is fast, but the proof is, the proofs are quite big. So risk zero wins there, right? There's like it's new inst. But when you compare T's and ZK, there is really no competition. T's currently offer near native performance uh, because, as I said, you encrypt the whole VM, right? So you could run REF in uh, TDX or AMD SUV. Would it be as fast as it's you know, on a bare metal? Probably not, but it would be good enough. But you can't run REF uh, on ZKVM, right? So if you, if you have an application that is performance heavy and you need private computation or you need verifiable computation, TEAS is the only way that maybe you can do it. Uh, if you want to do the ZK way, you'll have to make very serious performance uh, trade-offs. So basically here we, we made an analysis and kind of compared or contrasted the various technologies to give you a lay of the land, right? This is not a paper, uh, this is not research, this is, uh, this is a rule of thumb that you can use so that you know when you want to, pr to build a product, which te te technology you should take a look first, right? So if we start with performance, it's not great for most of the uh, ZK, but with Intel SGX it's great, right? That's easy. With security, it's the other way around. You, know, you could say that ZK uh, have much better security because there is no trust assumptions, or at least there are less. But with T's, security is, is not great. There is a tax, right? With, with, with ZK, it's very hard to, you have to find a bug inside the VM, you know, the, Z, the circuits, which is much more complex. And if we're going to analyze more specifically the TEs, SGX is quite less secure than TDX or SEV. So if security is important to you and performance, then probably you want to go with TDX or SEV, for example. Trust assumptions. Again, kind of the same. Uh, all the ZK have the same about trust assumptions, which means that you know, if it's untrusted hardware, you can't do private computations, uh, and you have to do a trusted set ceremony to uh, set up the ZK parameters. But that, you know, that's okay. That's, we, we have aligned as a community that's not terrible. And with uh, TEs, you, know, you have a lot of trust assumptions. Not as bad as we like to say, but you have. Nothing is really mature. <laughs> Everything is quite experimental, unfortunately. Uh, probably risk zero and AMD are the most, uh, you know, the most mature technologies with HGX leading the way. It's been around for a few years, and there is you know, a substantial community around it. And to be honest, I didn't expect to end up to these ease of integration results. <laughs> 
the ZK is much easier to integrate than T is actually. Much easier. You know, I will not even mention TDX or SEV. It was, it's a pain in the ass. Uh, there is a team that works very, uh, you know, they're, they're using AMD SEV, and they're, they talk often with the AMD team to figure out how to use it. Um, I think the interesting outcome for, you know, as I was researching for ease of integration, is that the teams behind the ZK, pro these ZK protocols are building product for product builders, right? They are thinking that they want to use, the, they want to build these platforms so that other people can easily build on top of them. And that's why they're quite easy to integrate, right? It's not just a ZK VM, but there is a plethora of tools and tooling around it, and documentation, and community, and examples that enable you to actually build products, right? Uh, for example, the Risk, Risk Zero, they, they have created you know, a network, so you can send your proof to be uh, generated there. You, you, know, you can easily verify it on solidity, on chain, right? Uh, they have worked on like, uh, reducing the proof size. They, they have approached it as a product. While TEs are much lower, you know, lower level, right? An analogy would be that TEs is just a ZKVM. So they're quite hard to, to use, actually. And I think that's, you know, realistically, and that's understandable, one of the main reasons we haven't seen them, uh, we haven't seen them used so often. Because it takes quite an investment for a team to actually understand how that works and how to use it. Yeah. Did you change the side? I didn't. <laughs> I think you did. What's next? Um, we can go to the next slide. It's not important. There's a spelling mistake. In you app? That wasn't me. I'm not the one born in Greece. I'm just Greek. <laughs> Greek Canadians. Posh. Uh, um, all right. Let's talk about application. We're gonna like you. We got like four applications, and go through the like, the trade-offs of using zk versus t's, and understand like really where the I don't know up to you really to decide where you think the trade-off really exists there. And we'll do this in context of things that we're doing on chain. So this is not like a fully off chain system. These are like the end result is we're like posting to chain something. Um, so trading, right? Uh, you want to you want to trade. You want to you're uh, a trader, and you want to basically don't leak any alpha, right? You fear that uh, information will be leaked either to the provider or to the markets. What is information? Information like the, what size uh, of your positions, what, are the, what is the asset allocation, uh, what's your enterprise. There's a lot of uh, information that can be leaked because trading is a very competitive uh, game. And it's quite hard to do with ZK, right? Uh, for example, uh, Penumbra is a great example. Uh, it's, it's a private ZK chain built on Cosmos. And the idea is that you, they have this uh, private DEX. And I've been building it for three, four years now. Right, it's an amazing team. But it's like seriously hard work to do that. They had to innovate in a lot of ways to be able to offer that level of privacy with no information leaking. Well, if they used T's, for example, probably they could have shifted it in you know, half the time. Uh, because these not only offer the privacy, but you don't have to make, you don't have to innovate in order to be performant. It's performant by, you know, by definition. So that enables you to be a bit more sloppier <laughs> in engineering and ship faster. You don't, you don't have to find tricks to make the ZK uh, uh, efficient enough so that your product is actually useful. Bridges is an interesting one. Both of us having deep pre-experience with 
interoperability solutions. Unfortunately. Fortunately. Uh, <laughs> this is an interesting trade-off. Um, I think, and I become a double, it's almost double standard how I had the, this, I was expressing before, how important are you? But I think when we're talking about systems that are built upon billions of dollars of volume trading over time, you know, in the future, let's not talk today, let's talk in the future, RTs and the, tr the trust assumptions there worth making a trade-off for. This is not no longer a product that is in its own isolated box. Bridges are something that are effectively a commodity to m interact and use blockchains, especially as we see hundreds of them spinning up um, within a roll-up app chain world. And I think the real interesting use case here is to actually do something very similar to what was said from the audience, which is you need to bundle your options together. The cost trade-off, and when I say cost, I'm talking about both computational on-chain um, and, and, and speed of using ZK can both be slow, slower, and really slow, <laughs> like 30 minutes slow in some cases, for a transfer. Whereas in T's, we can get that pretty fast, as explained by Odysseus over here. And so if we start to bundle this into like the concept of like MPC, or some sort of multi-party computation, but you look at it from the point of when settlement occurs, we can settle T's very, we can settle like a basic EOA transaction really, really fast. We can settle a T transaction to proving some sort of state with the bridge also quite fast and cheaply on chain. And then every, on a given epoch over a period of time, you can use ZK to then prove that entire range was done correctly and effectively. And I think it's a really unique case where you can kind of blend them together to get a really good mixture of trade-offs, right? Fast, more trust assumptions, slow, higher security, cost more money to do the transfer. And I got five minutes. Good thing we already did Q&A because it's basically what we did the whole time. So I think in bridges space, it's really interesting. And I think we're going to start seeing an emergence of a lot of bridges doing that, um, kind of blending this. Uh, we, at, you know, at Chainsafe, we call it tailored security. It's something like we do work with on um, and really offering that optionality, not necessarily with T's, but you know, other proving systems. And I think this is applicable to other proving systems in general. You know, it's like you can combo these things together to grow your overall security threshold. Um, you just need to think about how you go and implement that. Yeah. And then we have, uh, you know, private transactions. And that's an interesting one because if you take every transaction on its own, it's very hard to be that valuable, right? The question now becomes, you know, what if, for example, a T is, uh, uh, it's compromised and then the attacker is harvesting essentially uh, you know, either information or private keys. So again, we go back to the whole concept of trade-offs. And because transactions are quite simple, one could say that it would be better just to ZK for that. Because it's, it's, it's not computational in, uh, intensive. So the, you know, the possibility of, the, you're not making any trust, any, any particular trade-off to do that use case, right? So why not just maximize security and trust assumptions? Video games is a really interesting one. I think you can use both, but I'll use this in the context of privacy within a video game. Um, are we familiar with Battleship? Okay, cool. Or, okay, that, that made my life easy. The other option would have been like Age of Empires. 
Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, in both cases, you have a hidden map, right? And if you want to play this on chain, if anybody, if to do the ZK required to basically constantly tell you and prove to you was somebody's ship in this specific spot, you know, your opponent, you both have ships placed everywhere and you don't know where the opponent is and you're trying to blow them up. That's quite, again, back to my previous one with, you know, on-chain stuff, that's expensive. This is not something easy to do, maybe easy to implement, expensive to do on-chain. Now you're doing a roll-up and, you know, you're on an app chain. But let's say it's, like, expensive. With T's, again, really cheap to do it on-chain, really efficient. And there's another unique property here, which is, like, you know, if you're concerned about the overall trust assumptions of a T, this is like an ephemeral issue. It's like how much value does this game of Battleship really have? Sure, you could wager like $10 billion on it and then now we have a different topic, but like... <laughs> also, if we're gonna have an exploit happen extremely fast on this private data, if this game lasts for five minutes, how fast can an exploitation happen on a side channel or if through software on those chips, where they'll actually know and understand what's happening there to be able to respond to that data in this ephemeral time of the short window of five minutes. So with that, we didn't give you an answer. I just want you to walk away thinking, you know, it's the next time you have this conversation about we need ZK, make sure you have the conversation about why not T's. Thank you. I have a copy more. Oh, it's still mic'd up. That's awkward. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. It was beautiful.